My name is Jim Schusler, and I've had the, the distinct privilege to work with a team at Samsung Strategy and Innovation Center on SimBand for the last mm, quite a while, an intense ride. And uh, we're uh, here to tell you about SimBand and the, the set of sensors that we've worked on with iMac today. So let me jump into the agenda. A little bit of housekeeping. We're going to go through a, a tag team here of myself, and then my friend and colleague Andrea Tosati will talk about the, uh, the software overview. And then I'll be uh, covering the first part on hardware. So we'll uh, jump right in. And let me tell you about the SIM band. If there's one thing to remember about SIM band, it's that it's not just really one band. It's a modular platform. We built SIM band to support a variety of sensor modules. You can see on the lower right there something called the bucket. And this supports a universal connector and space for a variety of sensor modules. We support all of the infrastructure, the communications, especially to SAMI. It's got both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So it doesn't really need a phone, although it can use one if you'd like. It has user interfaces. It's got a big, bright display. It's got lots of space for a rich user interface. And we'll show you a little bit more of that later. And it also has the internal power and data interfaces for those different sensor modules. If you've looked at Kickstarter or Indiegogo recently, you've seen a number of different band concepts. And we know that there are a lot of innovative companies out there that's got, that have great algorithm ideas or great sensor ideas. But up until this point, they've had to basically do all the heavy lifting of the band itself, all, the, all those communications and user interfaces and so on, in order to get their idea to market. But Samsung wants to partner with these innovative companies, and we want to help them get to market faster by giving them the SIM band infrastructure. So let me jump into the reference sensor module that Samsung SSIC has worked on with iMac. And that is SimSense. Now, SimSense has a variety of sensors. It's probably got the largest collection of sensors in the world at this point. It's a playground for algorithm developers. It's really terrific. There are potentially 35 channels of photoplasmography. That includes seven different LED junctions and five different photodiodes that can be combined in any way. It's completely arbitrary and up to you. Those go over the ulnar artery, and that's on the, on the left-hand side. On the right, you'll see bioimpedance. Bioimpedance is a measurement of your body's conductivity and if you think of it this way, uh, your blood contains iron. Iron conducts electricity. So more blood conducts better, less blood conducts less. In that case, you can see a signal as the blood flow changes in your wrist over time, especially for heart rate. But there's a lot more to that equation than just heart rate. So we'll see what we can tell in the future there. There's also galvanic skin response. And that's really a measure of the conductivity of the surface of your skin. If you think of how your sweat glands dilate and emit sweat, um, that conductivity changes. So one of the measures is for calorie prediction. As you're exercising, you sweat more. The conductivity increases of your skin. And we can use that as a measure of, of calorie prediction. In addition to that, your uh, autonomic nervous system, basically a, a, the part of your nervous system that you don't have any control over, will um, change as you get more anxious. So GSR has been used in lie detectors. So that's uh, another potential there. Maybe we could uh, do a lie detector. Um, then finally, um, we have the, the accelerometer, which you're probably all familiar with. It's, a, it's, in this case, a three-axis accelerometer, although there's actually a nine-axis accelerometer available in the base unit uh, up on top here. Um, a more innovative sensor is the ECG electrocardiogram. 
I'll be going into that a, a bit more uh, here, and then skin temperature. One of the most important things that uh, we can do is synchronize these in time, because in the past, you could do photoplasmography, you could do ECG, all of these things were available as separate sensors. But if you can time synchronize them, you can do a lot more. And we do that in each of these. One of the applications will be in timing the difference between your ECG and your PPG, which is a measure or a proxy to your blood pressure. So we're excited about how that might develop. I said a little bit about the ulnar artery. Um, here, if you put your hand out in front of you, let's take your uh, left hand and put it out in front of you. Your ulnar artery is on the bottom side over here. Your radial ar artery is towards your body, toward where your thumb is on this side of you. Those two arteries were, are very important because there are, they have a lot of blood flow in them. And we've designed the sensor array with the human anatomy in mind. The PPG sensors largely cover the ulnar artery. Now, the different colors go to different depths of, of uh, penetration in your wrist. The red and infrared go deeper. That's been used for uh, saturated pressure of, pressure of oxygen, SpO2. Um, and then the yellow, the uh, green, and then the blue go successively further out toward the surface of the skin. So blue, for instance, is uh, just at the shallow depth of the skin. These will be useful for different algorithms for different reasons. Maybe, maybe uh, blue might be good for motion artifact reduction. When you move your, your band in relation to the uh, skin, the, there's a vibration there that can cause uh, unwanted signal uh, quality problems and uh, we want to mask that out. The bioimpedance targets the radial artery, and I, as I said, your, your uh, blood is conducting electricity, so that's uh, how we tell your heart rate in that case. But there are other measures that bioimpedance can be used for. I mentioned the ECG earlier, and this is three different electrodes that are on the band, two of which are inside, but one of which is external to the band. And what we do is we have a reference electrode that sets your body at a potential that's one half of the voltage, the full scale voltage on the differential receiver amplifier. And then the other electrode is, is the uh, input to that amplifier, one half of it. And then we take it through your heart around and touch the clasp here and you get the other leg of that differential amplifier. And that's how we get a good quality ECG signal. So let's go inside of SimSense a little bit. Now, Athena and Apollo are code names that we've used internally for the two different components within SimSense. The top layer where the electrodes are mounted is Athena, and it contains the um, the LEDs, the photodiodes, the electrodes. It also contains the temperature sensor because we want that right next to your skin. So we hide that temperature sensor underneath an electrode with a little bit of thermal glue. Uh, Apollo contains the processing electronics. And I'll go a little bit uh, more into that in a bit, but I want to uh, be really clear that we're opening this up as a reference platform for you to play with. We're going to be opening the schematics. Each of the components will be known, and you'll be able to make changes or to replicate the, the design if you, if you so choose to. There's a lot of surface area on the PCB. It's kind of surprising. If you use both sides, you've got over uh, 600 square millimeters there available to you. So let's dive into Apollo, which is in the center of the block diagram on that uh, graphic there. Apollo is powerful for, for two reasons. It has an ARM M0 processor in the iMEC chip. Now, iMEC has made a bioprocessor called Magic, and it uses that for the analog front end processing. It uses it also for some sample rate conversion that's being done, some very low level acquisition housekeeping there. 
The next processor is an ARM M4F. It's an NXP Niobe processor. The F is very important because it has the floating point unit there. So we found that to be really critical when you're taking mat, um, math, MATLAB uh, algorithms and converting them to C. It's a whole lot easier if you don't have to go to integer math. So in this case, we want to make it easy for our, our partners, and you can use that floating point unit, a very efficient one there. Um, we've chosen SPI as, uh, as the uh, interconnect, and we also provide battery power from the base unit. Let's go into the, uh, the SPI a little bit here in more detail. You might uh, wonder uh, why we made that choice. Uh, because there are so many other more interesting, arguably, uh, serial interconnects available today. Uh, however, we wanted to choose something that was universally available, low cost, low power. Uh, it had a number of advantages to it. You can choose microcontrollers from just about any manufacturer in the world and find that you can communicate with them through a variety of SPI uh, signals. Um, it's higher bandwidth than many of the other interfaces that are very simple uh, and perhaps older. Um, we use two megabits at this point, which offers plenty of bandwidth for all of the different channels to communicate with the base unit simultaneously so we don't have traffic congestion problems um, uh, given the protocol that we've chosen. Um, the current SIM band, just to give you an idea, uses I believe it's 14 different streams are moving between the sensor module and the base unit when it's fully on. And then the, the uh, connector at the bottom here, um, oh, I was hoping that was a laser pointer, but uh, it's obviously not. <laughs> Let me go back and uh, use the mouse here. Um, now. Right here in the bucket is a spring contact connector. And this connector gets compressed with four screws here on each of the sides. As you put a sensor module in, you'll find that it, um, it gets compressed down. I've got one here. And um, uh, it. I'll uh, do this uh, for, you, for any of you later who want to come up. But there's a connector in the middle here, and it gets pressed down into the bucket, and that's how the contacts are made. There are 12 conductors there. OK. Finally, the power is provided uh, at, uh, through this interface, and it's essentially a direct connection to the battery. Why did we do that rather than, say, give you a fixed 3-volt or 2-volt rail? The reason is we knew that some sensors had high peak power demands. And we want to give you the lowest impedance path to the battery as possible. Yes, you have the responsibility now of putting a PMIC or some type of a voltage converter into your sensor module. But it really gives you, the designer, the most freedom to design around the needs of your sensor. We know that some sensors, as I said, require high peak uh, uh, current. Uh, so, and because that path is about 150 milliohms or so, maximum worst case to the battery, we think, uh, boy, you could really do some damage. You could actually crowbar the whole base unit if, uh, if you, you made an error there. And in, indeed, that's true. So we have to set some limits. What are those limits that you can uh, safely take from the battery. The one, the peak power, we believe is 100 milliamps. This balances the freedom that you have for the design to the uh, safety of the base unit. And then the second limit is 50 milliwatt hours averaged over 24 hours of, of uh, use. Why did we pick that? That's to balance operating life of the band with the uh, uh, amount of power that you have to use. These are, we believe, fairly generous, uh, and that a whole variety of sensors can be designed within these constraints. Just to keep account on that, the base unit has the ability to, to monitor through this Coulomb counter. And of course, we have the ability to turn it on and off 
um, to save power and to do a, a very nice hard uh, power cycle, especially important when you're debugging all of these. So with that, um, I'd like to open it up for a few questions, and uh, then we'll uh, move into the uh, software area. How am I doing on time? Um, yeah, good? 18? Yeah. I've been really excited about this reference design, uh, but I'm wondering, is, is there one really good source to, of uh, sensor technology component books where, where you can go and look to stimulate your creativity about what, ki what kind of killer app you might build uh, with it? Sure. That's a great question. Is there one great source that you can go to for uh, sensor design? And you know, I think this is a great opportunity for somebody to write a book, but I'm not aware of, of one great source for, for all variety of wearable sensors at this point. The information seems to be in, in silos, in my view, and I think there's an opportunity for um, co uh, bringing this together. Follow-up? Well, you know, I, I look at all the wearables out there, and they all suffer from the same flaw, which is the designers said, well, it's got to be cheap, so we'll get cheap and low-fidelity sensors and, and give those to people and give them inaccurate data that's only good relative to the, the, the you know, you know, you know if you're a couch potato yesterday and if you move today. Right. Uh, but really not uh, high-fidelity data yeah. uh, that, that's, that's useful. You're touching on the quality of the measure itself. And we're keenly aware that what we need to do here is develop credibility in all of these measures. Uh, for instance, we have a partnership with UCSF that's going to be validating some of our, our sensors, and we're excited to work with them and with others to increase the quality of these. Because if we don't have a trust in the underlying quality of the measures, then any of the algorithms we build on top will not have credibility either. I think we're really in the horse and buggy stage of this, uh, this journey of, of wearable uh, biosensors, and we're going to see tremendous improvement uh, over the next few years. Uh, we need to develop trust because I think you've heard some of the other authors speak about how these devices get bought, worn for a few days, and then they get put in a drawer. And you know that, that has to be overcome. That cycle has to be broken. And one of the ways we break it, at least that I'm responsible for, is working on sensor quality. Cool. Thanks. One more follow-up. Uh, I would argue against the book right now. The field is developing too fast. But could you maybe recommend a couple of authoritative blogs or websites? Could I suggest a number of, of blogs or, or websites to go to for, for sensor data? For S sensor development, like what's going on in the industry? What's new, what's good, what's brilliant? <laughs> what sucks? Sure. So um, there are a number of conferences that I really trust in this area. The uh, ACM has a, a pervasive computing uh, group. Uh, Association for Computing Machinery has a, a conference every year uh, called Pervasive Computing, which uh, has, has attracted a number of authors. Um, I know um, I met uh, Rosalind Picard from MIT there. I was very impressed uh, about her work on uh, effective computing, which is related to GSR sensors. I think that's some of the world's best data on GSR, for instance. Um, the un different universities around the world are really focused on this now. So I know the University of Washington has a number of, uh, of interesting programs going on. Cornell does, um, uh, Georgia Tech. Um, we're, we're talking with, uh, with all of these people, and we're interested. If you're here from a university, you know, we're, we're you know, very, very interested in, in working with you. But, but directly, I don't know that there's one particular source um, yet. Yeah. Final question? Okay, we'll, uh, of course, both of us will be available afterwards. Thank you very much. Don't forget this. 
All right, let's see if I know how to use this. Yes. Uh, so thank you, Jim. My name is Andrea Trasatti. I'm heading developer relations for Simban and for Sami. Uh, we looked at uh, the hardware part of Simban. Now I wanted to give you an overview about the software and, and what uh, drove our decisions around how to build software for uh, Simband. So Simband was designed from the beginning to support multiple sensor modules. We built the SimSense uh, as a reference design. We wanted it to be the starting point, the example that people can use uh, to look at. But we already have a couple of partners that have their own sensors that connect to uh, Simban, and they're using the connector that Jim was describing. The need and the desire to support multiple sensor modules has um, driven our decisions on the software side as well. So in Simban, we have multiple components. Uh, on the left here in this diagram, I have SimSense. On the right, I have the base unit. Jim has talked mostly about SimSense from a hardware perspective. I thought I would also give you an overview from a software developer perspective. So we have two chips on SimSense. Both are ARM, M0 and 4, designed respectively by iMac and NXP. And they have different memory and, and CPU uh, capabilities. The M0 in SimSense, we use it to take the data out of the sensors and push it to the M4. Uh, the computing power is pretty limited, but obviously the power consumption is also very, very limited. The M4 uh, is where we do our time synchronization. This is something that is very, very important for the Simban platform uh, that allows you to correlate data, and I'll touch uh, more on this later. Uh, it has a little more power. It has 96K of RAM and 500K uh, of flash memory. The data comes out of the M4 and it goes to the A7. We have designed a number of algorithms that will be available, and we have designed them from the beginning thinking that these can run on both uh, processors, the A7 and the M4. The, the power, of course, of the, M, of the A7 is, is much greater, so that's where we run currently most of our algorithms. But for example, on the M4, uh, we currently do the resampling. The data that comes out of the sensors, each sensor has different capabilities, and so the, um, the sampling that comes out of the sensors is different. On the M4, we take this data and we resample it at 128 hertz so that, that, so that we can have it all at the same rate and synchronized. And then on the A7, we can, we can use it more efficiently. Uh, in the base unit, we also have a Wi-Fi uh, and a Bluetooth radio. Currently, we're using mostly the Wi-Fi. Uh, we wanted a device that would be completely independent from, from a, a phone. This is a device for developers. It's a, it's a developer platform. We want you to be able to, have to wear it in the office and see the data in real time coming in and be able to debug it in real time without having an app uh, in between that you have to manage and develop. Uh, but you know, if you want to use Bluetooth for any reason because you want to pair it with a watch, you still can do that. And then the base unit has four gigabytes of data. This means that we can store a lot of information uh, without uh, running uh, into problems of memory. Um, the Wi-Fi means also that we can actually store this data in the cloud and free memory. Uh, in our tests, we've seen that with all the sensors running, uh, we can easily store uh, at least one day, closer to two days of data in the four gigabytes of data of, of flash memory. Uh, but as data gets uploaded to the cloud, we can free up space and give you more uh, content. Oh, I, mentioned, I forgot to mention the USB connector we all like, love wireless, but USB connector is always great to be able to connect to the base directly. You can charge your uh, device with the USB connector, you can connect it to the PC, you can flash the device. Uh, very convenient all the time. Always a great backup plan. So from, from a software perspective, all this data comes out of the sensor module, and we say, we, we call it stream. Uh, all the data that comes out of the sensor, we call it a stream, and a stream has different characteristics. Uh, each stream is different from, from 
another stream, depending on the sensor it comes from, depending on the data that it holds. Uh, so it has characteristics. Um, it has a rate, in most cases, 128 hertz. As I said, we resample it. Uh, but it can be other types of data. It can be a signal, like from the PPG, we will have a signal. But from the, um, we, it could be a rate. Uh, so my heart rate, it will be a number. It could be an incremental number. So the steps that I did today, uh, it's one, two, three, four. It can be an enumeration. So for example, the activities that I'm performing, walking, running, uh, jumping. And so we have all these characteristics. We try to keep uh, um, the definition of these characteristics of the streams as open as possible. We try to cover uh, a wide spectrum. But for example, with new sensors uh, being implemented with Simban, it would be very interesting to hear also what you guys think about it, what else needs to be implemented uh, to define what a stream is. As I mentioned earlier, everything is time-coded and synchronized. This is, this is super important for Simban. It allows you to correlate information. You can uh, correlate that, for example, the signal coming from PPG uh, is being affected by movement because you're, you're seeing movement in the accelerometer. Uh, if we look at data in Simban, it's always uh, associated with a time. And when you want to analyze data, you want to basically extract a slice of this data starting from a certain moment in time to another moment in time. And in this diagram, I'm actually showing different cells where some are blue and some are white. Um, for every instant in time, there's always a value in, in Simban. Like there's also a, always a cell associated with that. Some of them will be filled with a value. Some of them will not be filled. So they will be null. This is important, for example, for heartbeats. Uh, so when we uh, identify a beat, we will have a cell with a value. But in between beats, you will have cells that are empty. So this is how data flows into Simban. And in Simban, we don't really have apps in the sense of how they are uh, you know, uh, understood nowadays in mobile platforms. You don't have an app like you would on iOS or Android. Uh, we have what we call algorithms. And algorithms are really a way to interpret the data and do something with it. So we have the data that comes from the sensor on the left. It gets uh, processed in the M4. And then it goes into we call, in what we call Simpsons D. Simpsons D is where uh, the data is processed. And we attach all the metadata, like the characteristics, the rate, the type of signal, the type of stream. Um, and data D is where really we uh, see developers, developers interacting with the platform. Data D is where, uh, when you want to write an algorithm, you, be, you will be querying data, and then you will saving data. As I mentioned earlier, everything is a stream in Simban. We have as many streams as basically uh, sensors that we have. And then when you write an algorithm, you can read from any stream, but you cannot write to existing streams. You have every algorithm is a new stream. You're going to save data into your stream, which means that you're going to share this data. This data is going to be part of data D, and it can be used by other algorithms. What we are trying to do here is really build a platform where uh, all the algorithms are sharing data and building one on top of the other. Um, so if I want to build an algorithm, for example, uh, to calculate blood pressure, um, it took me a day to understand how you do it. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor. So it took me a little time. But what we do here is we use a function that we call get timestamps. Uh, we have two or three major functions that we expose to developers that are useful for algorithms. Get timestamps is one. And as I was mentioning earlier, uh, I, I extract a, time um, a slice of data with a given from and to time. And I will read the timestamp. So this function specifically, it just returns me basically a list of the instances, the timestamps where there is a value. Then I could use alternatively get samples where I will actually get the values. So for blood pressure, what I want to do is uh, read the signal from the ECG, read the signal from the PPG, and I want to calculate the difference in time that occurs between when I have the pulse from the heart on, on when actually the blood uh, arrives uh, at my pulse. And so based on that, I can uh, correlate. I, there is a direct correlation on what is my blood pressure. 
So what I will do is I will extract the timestamps from the ECG, the timestamps from the PPG. I calculate the difference. I'm not going to go into the details of exactly what is the uh, science behind it. The bottom line is once I've done my calculation, I use a new function that we call send that saves the data into data D. Now, theoretically, what you would have to do is uh, read this ECG, find the beats, read the PPG, find the beats, and do the, uh, your own algorithm. But because everything is a stream and you can read from streams from other algorithms, you can actually rely on the algorithm that we have already created for ECG and PPG to detect the beats. So really, the blood pressure algorithm is a lot simpler. You just rely on an algorithm that someone else has written in the platform, made available to you, and you can just uh, focus on what is your, your area of expertise and, and just makes your life a lot easier. The last step is to get to the far right of the diagram where the data is visualized. And we have a set of APIs for visualizing data. We have built this simple uh, visual interface to show what the data is. And it, we think it's pretty easy to plot data on the screen. I talked about a lot of streams. We have all the streams that come out of the sensors. As I mentioned, we have uh, defined some algorithms ourselves to try First of all, to validate the platform itself. We wanted to see what we could extract as values from uh, our sensors. And then we wanted to make it easier for people that want to use uh, SIMBENS. We have heart rate, heart rate variability, blood pressure that I just mentioned. And then we have standard classic algorithms like steps that have performed so far, my average steps daily, my activity. One stream in particular that I want to focus on is the confidence indicator. As Jim mentioned, uh, different sensors have, uh, will return different values, and there are different contexts in which uh, this data could be more or less, uh, not useful, but clean. There could be noise in the signal. So we built the confidence indicator as a separate stream associated with each of the streams that come out of SimSense to help you uh, develop applications on top of it. In SIMBAN, we rate all streams from one to four, where one is the lowest grade and four is the highest grade. Um, what we do is we basically define a model, for example, for the PPG signal, where we said, OK, what is it that determines the quality of the signal? Well, of course, we want to look at the curve of the PPG signal. So how does it look like? And then what are the external factors? In, in the PPG signal specifically, because it relies on LEDs, there's a lot of factors that uh, uh, affect the quality of the signal and the noise that you might see. So it could be the position, could be the activity, could be am I wearing the watch in the right way, is it too loose, and so the wristband is moving, it's not uh, solidly in the spot. So the confidence indicator basically takes all these values into account and tries to, to help you, to give you a sense of how confident are we that this is a clean signal, that you're going to be finding useful information out of this. And obviously, the bottom line is, if, if you see a one or two, you probably don't want to use that signal, or you want to use it in uh, correlation with another signal that you might find. You could compare two or three different signals. If it's a four, you probably can use it. You know, you have high confidence. Just to give you a sense of <laughs> what is the difference in quality that you can find in one of these devices, and this probably goes back also to the issue of quality of signals out of these devices that we try to wear uh, for, for fitness, for information about ourselves. So on the left, we have what we call a confidence one. You can see the, the line is really jumping around. We have high peaks on the left. Then we have a lot, that big mountain on the right when a confidence four is very close to what we would expect for a good PPG signal. You can see the shape is very, very different. And the best part is we built our own uh, models for our signals. So that, is, that work is already done. Uh, if you build new signals, if you integrate new sensors, obviously we expect that you will use the same infrastructure to build a similar system. So we did a lot of talking. Let's see what my heart rate is right now. Usually I'm at, when standing, I'm at about 
high 80s. Can we turn the Elmo on? OK. All right, so you can see at the top I have the ECG. Let me see. Oh, too much. Um, OK. So on the left, I have the ECG. We had the, the lead indicator that was off. I put my finger on it. It goes to on. And now in a couple of seconds, you will see the ECG. We have that bit bump. And then it should scale to a regular ECG like you've seen in the movies. There you go. Jim, can you do better ECG than me? No, you've got a picture perfect one. <laughs> That's why they make me do the demos. So heart rate right now for me is a little bit high, 104. And then channel four uh, is telling you which one of the channel of the PPG channels that we have available is the one where we have the highest confidence. If I scroll down a little bit, you see that we have eight, the zero and one, two and three, four, five, six, seven. So the four is the one where we have the highest confidence of a good signal. And you can see that like the two and three, for example, are a little crazy right now, while this lower one was actually pretty close to the diagram that I was showing you earlier. We also show some more data. Sorry about the brightness. Accelerometer, bio Z, skin temperature. So I guess, Jim, high heart rate, low skin temperature, yeah. GSR. That means you're speaking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the other thing that I'm going to show you very quickly while I keep talking is what we call a spot check. And this is another example application. Um, you can't really read, but I'm choosing seated. And here we try to make like a little game of holding the point still. And going back to what Jim and I were saying was, if you're holding still, you're more likely to get a very good signal in this environment. So we invented this silly game to just hold the person still and usually quiet would be better and now we we take exactly what i was mentioning earlier bpp is my blood pressure and we show you like a nice daily trends i took my blood pressure another couple times today so here we actually implemented the algorithm that i was mentioning a few seconds ago you hold your hand here ecg calculated for about 25 seconds and then uh, you know uh, ppg and we calculate the difference Sorry? It, it only works on Simban. It's developed on top of our APIs. So something that I probably didn't mention earlier was, uh, actually, I probably don't have, well, so it, it is built on Tizen. Uh, but our APIs currently are in C. So you, we don't have a complete integration with Tizen right now. But if you, if you are able of writing C or C++ software, then you can use it. Um, so the app itself is not available yet, uh, but when, when you get a Simban, you can get the app with it. I mentioned earlier how um, we have four gigabytes of data in, in the device, but um, the device is great for showing real-time information. The device is great for analyzing the signal that comes out of the sensors and showing me something in real time. I'm a little stressed out. I press the spot check. It tells me, yes, you're stressed out. You should sit down and relax for five minutes. Stop speaking in public. You should be great. But what about my, my how, how nervous am I at all my public speaking engagements? Do I get more nervous? Do I get less nervous? Uh, it's not that easy to showcase that data on the watch. It's a small screen. It's limited amount of data. We send our data up to the cloud in a service called SAMI, developed by our colleagues at SSIC. Uh, SAMI has a great uh, open API, super simple to use. Uh, for Simban, we use WebSocket. We open up a socket to SAMI, and we stream up all our data uh, to the cloud. We're streaming like tons of data points per second for all our sensors straight up to SAMI. 
I did not trust the Wi-Fi enough to give you a live demo of the data going from the device to the cloud and back. But we actually, Sami already has a web interface where with like a couple of seconds delay from when the data is being measured, you can actually see it in a web page and you can see all the graphs of your ECG and PPG signals, your heart rate basically in real time. And we can do this thanks to their WebSocket and REST APIs. Um, and you can build all sorts of clients that you want on top of it. Uh, right now, we, we built a web interface to manage your data, and uh, you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, Sami opened yesterday. You're welcome to use it with Simba and with other devices, with other sensors. Uh, it has both REST and WebSocket APIs. Uh, one of the key things of Sami is that the, the user owns the data, and if, if he wants to share data with other applications or users, he can do so, but he doesn't have to. And then the other thing is that Sami really enables the sharing of the data and the correlation, putting data in relation from multiple different sources, from different sensors, from different applications. Uh, am I working out with my SIM bend on, collecting data? And am I participating in a diet program? Am I burning enough calories? Uh, am I training for my marathon? You can put all this together, thanks to Sammy. We opened yesterday, beautiful website designed by our team. Same Ben, Sammy, you can find documentation, you can find more information. Basically everything I talked about today is on the website. There's much more information, there's nice diagrams, there's nice pictures of how SimSense was designed. What was all the thinking? Like Jim gave you an overview of what were the key points that guide us in deciding how to design Simpsons. There's a lot more information on the website. Um, we want to work together. This is a developer platform. We have not built a finished product that goes to Best Buy. This is a product that is modular, that is designed for engineers to build new sensors to put on the sensor modules. It's designed for software developers to create algorithms on, on top of the watch in the cloud. And that's what we want. We want to get cooperation. We want to work together. We're going to open source part of the software. We're going to um, offer as a reference license basically most of the software that is in Simban. You can see how it works inside. You can see how the APIs are written. You can see how best to work with it. And we're definitely seeking feedback. We're, we're trying to understand what can we do beyond this. We thought about one sensor module. We, I talked about Simpson, um, Sensi-Free and Elfie Tech building their own sensor modules, but there's, a, I don't know, a hundred, a thousand more sensor modules that can be built, different combinations of sensors for different uses. We want to hear all of those so that we can continue uh, building up the platform to have more information. So the website is online. You can find it at voiceofthebody.io. You can reach out to me, email, uh, sorry, Twitter, Jim Twitter, and then we have a, a group uh, Twitter account that you can reach out to uh, to ask questions, send us feedback, information on the website, anything that you want. We really want to talk to you. We really want to work with you. Um, now, if you want to, uh, oh, yeah. So if there's any questions, actually, before we basically wrap it up. Quick question about what are the dependencies on the Samsung devices? for the SIM band. I think there's a lot of confusion exactly how it's connected and then API-wise, um, how we... Yeah, so we focus mostly on the design of the sensor module. That's, that's where our core experience is and the software, of course. But for the watch, you probably saw it looks a lot like a Gear S. This is actually a customer version of the Gear S that um, our colleagues in Korea have done for us very nicely, very helpful. Um, it is based on Tizen, so if you have experience with the Tizen SDK, anything that you've written will work on this platform. Our APIs are a research project, are an innovation space that we're, we're trying to push the boundaries of what is out there today. So our APIs are unique to Simbend. Uh, they work on Tizen, and uh, you know, based on interest, based on where uh, the ecosystem is going to take us, then we're going to push. Uh, ties in to integrate our APIs. We're going to work with them. We, we want to work with the ecosystem, first of all, 
to understand what is what are the needs and what are the opportunities. And from a device perspective, like when can you go to a store and buy it? Um, this device costs a lot of money. You're not you're not gonna buy it, you know, as is. Um, there is work to do from an engineering perspective on working on a good price that can sell out there. So it's also about uh, what are the sensors of, of all the sensors that we have here, which ones are the most useful, which ones uh, need to be together so that you can do something really useful with it. What is, I'm not going to say business model, but what is like the, the market that you're trying to address. So that's why we are innovation center and that's why we want to talk a lot. We want to have a lot of interaction there. Hi, I'm wondering if you have um, other sensors that you have considered implementing but chose not to, at least in the first versions of them, um, and any reasons, uh, what, what were the considerations that went into that? For example, EMG, right? That's, is that something that you have thought about? Uh, electromyograph, right? Is that something that you think could be a candidate for sensors for the future? Jim? We worked with IMEC in selecting the set of sensors for this first uh, version of the, the reference sensor module. There are a number of other companies that have considered, say, EMG and various other uh, types of sensors. Um, I think we're really excited about one that uh, Andrea showed uh, that is a non-contact uh, uh, heart rate sensor. Uh, it uses an RF technique. So there, yeah, there are a number of other another, uh, combinations. Right now, we think that this set of six basic sensors, but again, I guess if you're counting 35 channels of PPG plus five is 40, <laughs> if we want to get into sensor wars or something. But uh, it's a lot of sensors, and you can and, and do quite a lot with it. But we're all, always interested in hearing about others. So yeah, thanks. I think that the interesting part is how you can make correlations between the different sensors that you have, right? Indeed. So what is going to add value to my one sensor that I'm looking at, and what can I build on top of the combination of two or three different ones? We knew that the low-hanging fruit there was PPG and ECG. So that's what we're starting with, which uh, will give us the blood pressure proxy. And I think that's going to provide a, a huge benefit to a, a number of people. So uh, in, t in terms of fusion, that's where we want to start. Yeah, thanks. Please, more questions? Yeah. More. Right, so motion artifacts are really uh, uh, an Achilles heel of exercise, uh, non-invasive non wearable sensors. And uh, as I mentioned, um, we're, we're taking whole new approaches with different types of sensors as one approach to it, but then we're taking more conventional approaches like how do we, you know, use the accelerometer to mask out, you know, very, very, very conventional. Uh, it's kind of an obvious thing. Um, so there's a lot of algorithm development that's going on. Our partners at LifeBeam are probably the world's experts in this right now, and we're, we're showing uh, some really great ECG, uh, heart rate work on the treadmill out at our booth, so I invite you to go visit on that. Um, and we prove it right, right before your eyes that uh, you know, we've got a guy running at 15 uh, MPH out there, and we're getting pretty good heart rate from him. So those algorithms were developed by LifeBeam that, that uh, use a number of different PPG signals in concert with one another. Um, if you talk to them, they're not using the accelerometer, which is kind of interesting. Um, what's your selection criteria for companies or individuals who are working with, some, like, let's say I, you know, come to your website and, you know, register and say, hey, I'm interested. Um, What's your, obviously you can't work with everybody in the world, right? You'd have to choose a few people to power work with. So if you can shed some light on how you would select the people you want to work with. Yeah, so um, I think we have a couple of aspects that we're working around. So one is how can we make a better use of the sensors that we have in SimSense? So it's around your expertise, maybe around one or more of the sensors your expertise around the algorithms that can be developed on top of the sensors that we have. So that's one reason that drives 
the decision. And then the other one would be around uh, you have expertise actually in completely different sensors and you want to build another one that would add value to the ecosystem. So you would have expertise on sensors that we don't know or that we haven't worked with. So that's what drives it. And I would say ideally in a perfect world we would have enough SIMBENs for everyone. Uh, initially, we have a limited number. That's what will drive the initial decisions. But you know, over the next uh, months, we're going to make sure that we can produce sufficient number for, for everyone that wants one. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. It really depends on the sensors that you're using. So, for example, uh, this past couple of days, we've been, you know, showing it to everyone. The LEDs that you have here uh, at the bottom of the wrist use a lot of energy. So, it is about optimizing the, the usage of the, of the energy that you have. So, um, in a day like yesterday or today, to be honest, in, in this demo mode, we didn't have to charge it. We charged it overnight. In the morning, we put it on, and at the end of the day, when we got home, we put it back to charge. Like a normal use would be a lot longer. You know, you would not be having the LEDs on all the time. And I think that there's a lot of like interesting, like there's a very interesting space there on how do you optimize the use of the sensors? How can you get meaningful data with minimal battery draw? Yeah, so one of the ways that we minimize power for heart rate might be moving from the PPG to the bioimpedance when you're sleeping. Um, typically, the motion is lower, so uh, because bioimpedance is a little more susceptible to motion artifacts, there are fewer of them while you're sleeping. So you might be getting a good signal at that point. Um, it's a lot lower power to do that. The other thing that Andrea mentioned is just duty cycling these things severely. So. It depends on the use case dramatically. You know, how often do you really need to get your heart rate for the measure that you're trying to produce? Um, but there's a 300 milliamp hour battery in the, in the uh, top of this. It's, uh, it's quite a lot of power. And uh, obviously, this takes some power, the screen, and so on. But uh, I think we've got sufficient battery life to give you um, a good playground. <laughs> um. Don't forget, there's a raffle. Answer the questions. You have a piece of paper, and you can win a prize tonight, right? 13th, yes, at 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. um, please rate our um, uh, talk. We would be very curious to hear your feedback on the talk itself, and obviously on our website, voiceofthebody.io. Uh, there's online forums to send us feedback questions, anything that might come to your mind at a later stage. We'd be very keen to keep talking with you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks.